All right. We're going to start right at 10 a.m. today. Let people trickle in. Um, welcome to our monthly meeting, uh, the virtual seminar. Today, we are going to be talking about an anti-inflammatory diet and lifestyle. Um, and if you are here, just know that this is being recorded. So um, the tiny little bit of font that has your name on it may be in the recording, as long as that's okay. Um, and I'm Katie. I'm one of the dietitians. You should know me by now. Um, but if you're not, welcome. And um, Nancy, can you hear me okay? Okay, perfect. So let's just jump right in. So we need to f talk first about what inflammation is. So inflammation is a vital part of the body's immune system response. We all have an inflammatory process, some stronger than others, but Basically, this signals the immune system to heal and repair damaged tissue, defend against bacteria and viruses, um, naturally occurring process in the body. Like I said, everybody has an inflammatory component, um, but inflammation can become a problem when it happens for a long period of time. This is called chronic inflammation, which leads to that systemic illness, the cancers, the heart disease, the diabetes, the things that we're all trying to avoid here. So... Um, Basically, we have our acute inflammation, like if you have a swollen ankle after an injury, a fever when you get sick, those are signs of inflammation, and that is a good thing. That's a short response with localized effects. The problem is that chronic, long-term, and whole-body effects of inflammation, aka persistent, low-grade inflammation, such as trauma, stress, depression, anxiety, uh, poor diet, which can alter the gut lining, a sedentary lifestyle, and um, weight gain, and lack of sleep— these can all lead to things that are, you know, chronic inflammatory conditions like the Barrett's esophagus, the rheumatoid arthritis, the uh, fatty liver disease, diverticulitis or colitis, diabetes, cancer, and even heart disease. Um, now, not all of these are caused by chronic inflammation, of course, but a lot of them tend to be more often so. So these are things that are preventable if we can follow sort of low diet, um, anti-inflammatory dieting and lifestyle components. Um, so another one to think about is oxidative stress and inflammation in our weight status. Many of the people who are watching this video are either on a weight loss journey or have been. So obesity is considered low grade inflammation and can lead to what's called insulin resistance. You may have heard this before. Um, insulin resistance is an impaired response of the body to insulin. Insulin's the cell, the, or excuse me, the key that unlocks the cell that lets the sugar into the cell for energy. So if we have a uh, insulin resistance, that means that more sugar is gonna be floating around in the blood. Um, and that can come up on our blood test that we do um, at your yearly physical. So if you have had a recent test, either at your doctor or here, and the fasting blood sugar was over 100, we do suggest talking to your primary care about a possible insulin resistance. Because what happens is that we overeat, um, and we tend to, you know, be overfed and undernourished, meaning that we're getting a lot of calories, but maybe not as much nutrition. And this can then lead to that oxidative stress and inflammation, especially when the fat is around our mid, uh, you know, mid middle or our trunk or our abdomen. So just things to keep in mind. Um, and we need to make these connections here. So when the nutrient quality of our diet is poor and the calories are high, like I just said, this can lead to more inflammatory fat cells to accumulate. And then we don't have the proper vitamins and minerals to help fight off or counteract these cells. So the way we eat um, can also, you know, impact how we feel about ourselves, maybe our self-confidence, our energy levels. But if we have, you know, depression or, or anxiety that isn't quite being treated, that can lead to becoming sedentary or overweight or making poor choices in our diet. So they're all interconnected. And then if let's say we have a gut issue going on, maybe untreated GERD or colitis, diverticulitis, IBS, that's, you know, these things can be triggered by stress. Um, so they're all sort of connected here. And we know that our gut is our second brain. So everything matters and our environmental exposures on top of all of this you know, tie it all together in a nice neat bow, we do have a, you know, tend to see a lot of inflammation in our, in our specific WTC population. And what we see commonly, you know, you guys um, may be familiar with some of these conditions is GERD or what's called Barrett's esophagus. Um, so chronic inflammation of that esophagus, right? That GERD gastroesophageal reflux disease, heartburn, um, acid reflux, 
long term not treated can lead to Barrett's esophagus, which is a precancerous condition that could lead to esophageal cancer. So we always are looking out for your, um, you know, esophageal health. We always recommend following up with your GI doctors outside of the visit. Um, but it's something that's maybe not 9-11 related per se covered by us is this conception of metabolic syndrome. Now, what is that? It's a cluster of things. It's high triglycerides, high blood sugar, or excuse me, blood pressure, waist circumference being over 40 for men and over 35 for women, a low HDL, less than 40 for men, less than 50 for women, and then a high fasting glucose, meaning over 100, or if you're being treated for um, diabetes or prediabetes already. These are all signs of, um, you know, insulin, uh, metabolic syndrome, um, diabetes and prediabetes. We don't do the A1C here. So we always recommend following up with your primary care for that. And then lastly, we're starting to see a common trend of fatty liver disease. Um, and that is diagnosed with a liver biopsy or sonogram. But the first step is seeing these altered liver enzymes in your blood work. So if you get your routine blood work with us, you will see your ALT, your AST, your triglycerides, blood pressure, HDL, and, and blood sugar. So these are things that you can get checked in on. Um, in addition, diverticulitis, pancreatitis, sinusitis are also inflammatory conditions. So that being said, how do we how do we prevent this? You know, the rest of the presentation, I'll be going through small but powerful changes that you can make on a daily basis and add to your routine to help you follow an anti-inflammatory diet and lifestyle. So I love the quote, an ounce of prevention is a pound of cure. So these are six, um, not simple, but but pretty concise ways that we can help fight our inflammation today. So the first step, decrease toxins. Step two, modify your body fat. Three, increase your antioxidants. Four, improve sleep. Five, manage stress. And lastly, move your body and exercise. So step one. Limit your toxin exposure, and I say as best as you can. So in order to think about an anti-inflammatory diet, we must first focus on removing the things that are causing the inflammation in the first place. So um, common things that we see are smoking. So if you're smoking, try and quit or work with our pharmacists on a smoking cessation um, plan for you. Um, heating plastic is a big one. So try not to microwave in plastic containers try to take it out and put it in a glass, you know, bowl or something just to avoid heating plastic as best as you can. Um, believe it or not, cooking in some of the, um, some certain cooking equipment can have some pro-inflammatory um, chemicals in it. So I always recommend using stainless steel and cast iron when cooking. Of course, avoiding heavy alcohol use. Alcohol um, basically affects our immune system and the way our body responds to illness and it can weaken your immune system along with causing a lot of different health conditions as we know. Um, always wash your produce. Um, there's still, the jury's still out on organic versus uh, non-organic produce, but always give it, give it a rinse, can't hurt. And then um, some people don't know about blackening of food. So you, you might order blackened chicken, blackened shrimp, blackened salmon, but the blackening on the grill, especially if it's a red meat, can be carcinogenic um, and can lead to this TMAO, which is without getting too sciencey on you guys, it can affect your your gut microbiome and lead to some some colon issues and and stuff like that. So we always recommend just grilling, just avoid the high high heat sort of um, food items, smoking, smoking things like that. Um, and then I have been doing some more research on our um, patients and have been recommending to drink filtered water or pure spring water or test your water. We do have a lot of microplastics in our water, which can be harmful in, um, you know, certain populations in certain cases. So while not everyone's water is the same across the island, I recommend, you know, trying to um, test your water or just use use a Brita or, you know, by, by spring water. Um, same goes for your shower head if that's possible. Everyone's different, but just an option here. All right. So step two, of course, we want to try and modify our body fat. So many of you that are here might be interested in weight loss, but uh, we do need to reshape our mindset and think about how we can maintain our muscle and lose fat. Most of us want to lose fat. We don't want to lose weight. Um, so fat, obviously, as you can see, too, from previous slides, is the driver of inflammation. So how can we modify our body fat in a healthy way? 
think of a boost mindset. Think of an add, not remove sort of idea. So prioritize protein, especially lean proteins, egg or egg whites, chicken, fish, turkey, lean skirt steaks or, you know, tenderloins, um, lean pork, like a pork tenderloin, and even plant-based uh, proteins like tofu, soybeans, uh, things like that. It can be helpful. And I, I do recommend having protein at all your meals and snacks. Fiber is your friend. Fiber can help you reduce your um, your bad cholesterol as well as your blood sugar. And it can be found in things like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, and seeds. Healthy fats are going to be much better for you in terms of inflammation. Uh, cooking with olive oil or avocado oil, um, eating nuts, eating seeds, and eating fatty fish. Um, and if you're someone who's like not really into these foods, definitely consider, you know, booking a one-to-one -one with us because we can help you figure out what foods you do like that would fall into this category. Um, and then hydration station, I call it. So you want to try and have at least six to eight cups of water per day or more, depending on your body weight. But I say a minimum for everyone across the board, men and women, is six to eight cups um, of just plain water. Um, obviously, if we want to grow our muscle, we do need to focus on strength training and maintaining our protein intake. And then the last piece of this puzzle would be, you know, focusing on finding a meal timing structure that works for you. Not everybody has it in their repertoire to eat five small meals a day or three meals, two snacks. Maybe people do intermittent fasting. That's where the one-to-one -one can be helpful because we can help you with your meal timing. Um, and then obviously in order to lose weight, we do need to be in a slight calorie deficit for weight loss. So I'll be sending you guys the, the, power, the PDF of these slides, but this is a way that you can determine your basal metabolic rate, which is basically the calories that you burn at rest. And that's based on your current body weight, your height, your age, and your gender. Uh, you then need to add an activity factor to figure out how many calories you burn in a day due to exercise and um, eating, sleeping, et cetera. And then we subtract um, around 250 to 500 calories to determine your daily calorie goal. A common thing that we see is that people are naturally burning almost 3,000 calories a day, and they're only eating 1,000 calories. So you're in a way too big of a deficit, and that can lead to chronic problems as well. You know, it's the way you lose the weight is just as important as how much you lose. So we do recommend a slight calorie deficit, and this makes you less hungry too. So um, this is one option here to do the basal metabolic rate calculator, but we also now have a Tanita body composition analyzer in our clinic, and we're getting more um, that measures your metabolic rate already and your muscle and your body fat. So we can measure this for you and work with you one-to-one -one on that. Um, and it's called a, you can come in for a body composition consult, or you can couple it with your nutrition visit. So it's really cool, and we're trying to get the word out about it. So if you're interested, please um, make an appointment. And it may start to become part of your monitoring visit, too. We just haven't gotten that far yet. So more to come. But you need to be eating less calories than you're burning in order to lose weight. But you need to be in a slight deficit to avoid, um, you know, undernourishing our bodies and start starving ourselves because that's not healthy. All right, step three antioxidants. So may you may have heard this term before, maybe not, but antioxidants are substances that increase oxidation. Oxidation is what can lead to that inflammation. Um, so especially ones um, used to counteract the deterioration of stored food products as well. So vitamin C, you might see ester C added to a lot of foods because vitamin C keeps things from going bad. So food sources of our antioxidants are going to be vitamin C, of course, the most potent sources in our diet are red bell peppers, broccoli, and strawberries. Folic acid, we hear that one a lot. Leafy greens are the number one source. Vitamin E is important um, in our diet, and it can be found in sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, and almonds. Vitamin A is a precursor carotenoid and can be found in things like carrots, sweet potato, and butternut squash. Reservatrol is found in red grapes, blueberries, and cranberries. Quercetin is found in citrus fruit and apples. Lycopene is found in tomatoes. Selenium is found in Brazil nuts. I actually eat one Brazil nut every day for my selenium intake. I take it like a multivitamin. Um, selenium is important for immune function, thyroid health, fertility, et cetera. And um, magnesium is a big one. I push magnesium with my patients because we really don't have a great source in our diet due to our soil and our farming practices. 
So pumpkin seeds are a great source of magnesium. And there are dietary supplements. I'm not going to be speaking about supplements today because everyone's different. But I do want you guys focusing on your diet and increasing more of these foods. And eating the rainbow, the different colors of the rainbow represent different nutrients. So you guys will see this slide. It's a little small, but basically the orange and the yellow represent that vitamin A. The red can represent that lycopene or can also represent that quercetin, very important for prostate health, heart health. The blues and purples are really good for memory. There's something called anthocyanin. So when I'm saying eat your vegetables, I'm not saying it just to say it as a dietitian, I'm saying it because it's literally vitamins and, and antioxidants, things that are going to give you so much energy and, and help you prevent chronic health outcomes. Also vegetables are that fiber that we talked about and fiber helps you feel more full, helps the stomach and mechanically, um, you know, basically stretches out the stomach mechanically and can help you feel more full, but also acts as a netting for a lot of different toxins and stuff that we consume like fat. So Eat your vegetables. And some people ask about nightshades. Like if you have arthritis, um, there is some people that say you should avoid things like eggplants, peppers, tomatoes, potatoes. There is currently a lack of evidence for this. Um, but I always say if you want to do a little elimination diet and cut them out for a couple weeks and then add one back in slowly. And if you if you get a flare up then maybe you are sensitive, but there isn't enough research to support removing them. The, the pros of them are much more potent and, re and research than the cons. And then other foods and beverages to fight inflammation. Green tea is excellent. It has something called ECGC, which is a natural antioxidant and can actually help with cholesterol issues. Cocoa, so I like cocoa powder, cocoa beans. So I'm not talking chocolate. I'm not talking, you know, Reese's, milk chocolate, you know, but um, pure natural cocoa is actually an, um, an anti-inflammatory food. Fish oil, like we talked about, olive oil, of course, beans and legumes have a prebiotic and um, great source of fiber and protein. And then probiotic food sources are found in things like sauerkraut, kimchi, and plain yogurt. And flavored yogurt, but plain yogurt is going to have less sugar. Turmeric is a popular one you guys may have heard of before, garlic and ginger. So I like to make salad dressings using turmeric or garlic or ginger garlic, stir fries. You can buy the turmeric already um, powdered or you can buy the root. Um, turmeric's best absorbed with a little bit of black pepper. And again, I'm not talking about supplements today, but if you are taking a turmeric supplement, take a peek and see if it has any black pepper extract in it. Um, if it doesn't, it's likely not being absorbed very well by your body. And then, of course, back to limiting foods. I don't want to focus on things we can take away, but I think it's important to note that um, there are foods that are considered pro-inflammatory. Um, obviously, one of them being just the fried foods um, because of the fat and the saturated fats and whatnot. But a lot of them are fried in things like corn oil and soybean oils, which have something called omega-6s. I don't want to go into too much of the details, but basically omega-6s are very potent in our diet, um, almost 50%. Um, corn oil, excuse me, is almost 50% uh, omega-6. And basically, it makes our omega-6 to omega-3 ratio off, and that can lead to certain diseases. Um, it basically turns on different genes that are pro-inflammatory. So use olive oil and uh, avocado oil whenever you're cooking, or a spray. If you're using a spray, try and use cold pressed canola oil or avocado oil spray. Coconut oil is okay too. Um, uh, alcohol, we already you know, discussed that. Processed red meats are a big one that I don't think people know about as much. Um, processed red meats in the form of like bacon, sausage, um, are actually a class one carcinogen for colon cancer. That is that is confirmed by the by the CDC. So do limit that intake. We could go have a whole webinar on, okay, well, what about cold cuts? What about, you know, it's just watch the sausage, watch the bacon, watch the capicola, the prosciutto, the salami, the pastrami, and try and choose more lean meats. Sugar and soda, of course, are things that are going to lead to that diabetes and insulin resistance. And then ultra processed foods. So what do I mean by ultra processed, right? Think about like, um, think about 
an apple, right? We have apples and then we have apple juice and then we have apple pie. So an apple and the apple juice are, are semi-processed, but the apple pie from McDonald's is ultra processed. That thing is no longer really an apple. Or we take um, thing, thing chicken, all right? We have a whole chicken. We then, you know, have ground chicken. Then we have chicken nuggets from McDonald's. So once that food is no longer really in its natural state anymore, it's ultra processed. But I am a fan of just semi-processed foods like ground meat, ground chicken, um, canned beans, things like that. But once it's no longer <laughs> like recognizable, that's when it's, it's gone. And, and we're not looking for perfection, but just think about this in your diet. And then obviously if you have a diagnosed food allergy or symptoms of an intolerance like lactose intolerance, avoid these foods as much as they as you can because they can damage your gut lining and burden your immune system. Uh, gluten, dairy, soy, shellfish, et cetera. If you have an allergy to something, avoid it, avoid it, avoid it. Because um, it, it, even if you don't feel crazy symptoms, you might get a little flare up. It's not good for you long term. The Mediterranean diet is, of course, the diet that we find to be the most inflammatory um, following these principles. So check this video out here where we review the med diet. We did this back in January, so I don't want to take too much time today, but this gives you an idea of the food pyramid, right? Lots of fiber, healthy fats, fruits and veggies, lean meats, seafood, a little bit of dairy, and then at the very tippy top is the red meats and sweets. Um, this does have red wine as an option, but again, I just think limiting alcohol in general is a good, good rule of thumb and drinking plenty of water and eating and socializing with family and friends, which we'll get into in a moment. Um, there's a really popular quote by a journalist, um, Michael Pollan, eat food, not a lot, mostly plants. Um, and if Amanda was here, she would say to eat proteins that swim, fly, or grow from the ground. So swim, meaning fish fly meaning turkey chicken and then growing from the ground is like the proteins like the plant proteins like beans and legumes so just think about the pyramid and check that video out if you haven't been around yet for that that's on our website um all right so we talked about diet now let's talk about some lifestyle factors um improving your sleep so lack of sleep has been found to trigger increased le levels of ghrelin which is your hunger hormone and decreased levels of leptin, which is your fullness hormone. So these can get very much altered. Sleep deprivation can alter your blood sugar metabolism and other hormones. Those who lack sleep are more likely to get sick after being exposed to a virus and can help um, or impact how fast you recover. And sleep is really when we detox. So think about in the morning, you have that film kind of on your mouth and your lips, your eyes get the eye boogies. That's because your body is literally detoxing overnight. So if you're not sleeping well and you're not resting your body, you're not allowing that rest and relaxation that your body needs and your parasympathetic nervous system, your central nervous system to relax and recharge. So definitely work on sleep. I know it's not easy and many people have a lot of sleep issues, but our general tips outside of seeing your sleep doctor are trying to avoid eating two to three hours before bed. Limiting your blue light exposure one hour before bed. So this is your phone, your tablet, your TV. If you can get a blue light cover or blue light glasses, those can inhibit the amount of blue light we absorb. Um, sleep in a cooler temperature. And then getting light first thing in the morning. So you want to blast your light like first thing in the morning, get some sun, and then low light to no light at night. This will help your circadian rhythm and help your body get into a better routine. Um, and this cute little puppy is thinking about the fact that in 2017, there was a study that found that sleep deprived people tend to eat at least 300 more calories a day than people who get enough sleep. So just something to think about. And then of course our mental health, right? Managing our stress, our immune system and our neuroendocrine system are extremely related. Um, like I said before in the presentation, everything is connected so managing our stress can also help us achieve the other uh, steps like better nutrition and sleep. Um, prioritizing self-care and alone time, increasing your mindfulness in the form of mindful eating, breath work, just slowing down in general. You know, slow down when you eat, focus on the task at hand, take every day one step at a time. 
Um, if you are in our WTC mental health program, you know, definitely follow up with your with your providers. If you're not and you're interested, let us know. We can always assist you. And um, I meditation, you know, taking a five minute breather just to sit back and, and just meditate on the day, focus breathing through your nose and out through your mouth. Th- these things can really help with our with our stress and that chronic inflammation that we've talked about. Um, and then lastly, move your body. We need to move our body. Sedentary lifestyle is the new smoking. So meaning that it can take years off of our life if we're not moving our, our body properly. And you, a lot of people do have some limited mobility issues due to back issues, injuries. I get that. But do what you can. Um, cardiovascular exercise is beneficial to support healthy blood flow. Great for the mental health. Honestly, I work out more for my mental health than my physical health. That endorphin rush, you know, the fact that you can check off that you did an activity that day. Um, strength training can help your uh, body increase the, that muscle mass that we're looking for. Um, and thus, you know, help that BMR rate that we talked about. And then moderate to vigorous exercise with appropriate resting can help you achieve that max benefit. But many people who are chronically inflamed, they actually don't benefit from like HIIT classes, like a heavy intensity spin class or CrossFit, because that can actually increase your inflammation. So I always recommend speaking with your doctor um, about all of this and considering sauna therapy as another form to help you detox if you're unable to exercise. Um, But again, always talk to your doctor and um, consider getting your CRP tested. This is an inflammation test that can be done and seeing if you're currently fighting any chronic or acute inflammation. We don't do the tests here. I would love it if we did, we're working on that. But uh, for now, go through your PCP. So, you know, as a summary of the steps, if people join late, we wanna decrease our toxins, modify body fat, increase our antioxidants, improve our sleep, manage our stress and move our body. Definitely easier said than done, but, you know, work on it, see what you can do, and we're always here to help. Um, Does anybody have any questions? Okay, wonderful. Well, this is being recorded. Uh, Ron, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, how do we hey. go about doing the, the CRT testing? Is there a, a specific place we need to go for that? You would have to ask your primary care. It's a blood test. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So next time you're due for blood work, see if they do CRP, see how much it is with your insurance. You could always call your insurance and say, um, cause the last thing we want to do is ask for that test. And the next thing we know, it's like $400 or something. So see, uh, what your insurance says and ask your primary care. Okay. Um, we did, you. yeah, we did do a nutrition study last year um, with some of our members with PTSD, and we did the CRP. So I'm hoping to do another study like that in the future. Um, but until then, uh, definitely go through your um, private insurance and your primary care. Um, I will be sending this PowerPoint out to everybody. So uh, Roberto, thank you um, for that question. I'll send a PDF of the slides out um, this afternoon or tomorrow or Friday. Any other questions for today, guys? And if you're watching at home and you have any questions, please let us know. I hope you guys enjoyed the um, webinar today. Next month is May 12th at 2 p.m. We're talking about emotional eating and improving our relationship with food. I have a question. Hey, Robert. Hi, I have a question. The uh, body fat test, um, you said that... um, we have to make an appointment. Is that appointment with you or during our physical? It is, well, kind of both. So it's in the nutrition consult room of the Comac clinic. So it can be booked as a separate appointment as part of a nutrition visit. It can be booked just to come in and do your body fat and talk about it. Or if you're here for your physical, um, we can do it, but it's only in the Comac office. Only in Comac. Okay, mm-hmm. got it. We're, and, we're working on it. Yeah, but. do you have a, a specific number we're supposed to call for the Comac office? Um, It would be the 855-1200. 855-1200, okay. Yeah. But if you're looking to make that appointment, you could just call me or email oh. me. Okay. Because I would be the one setting that up for you. 
Oh, okay, great, mm -hmm. thanks. Or Amanda, you know, whoever you guys say. Um, people had a question about fasting. I don't have a fasting strategy because I would want to know about your exercise and different things. So I think you might have joined late, but if you're looking for more of like talk about your specific meal timing, I would recommend scheduling a one-on-one -on -one consult with us so we can talk more. And that can be in person, through Teams, or on the phone. Because everyone's different with their fasting um, and, and what's safe for them. All right, folks, with that, it is 1030. Um, I'm going to let you all go. I hope you enjoyed. Keep an eye out for the PDF of the slides and check out our website for the next month's webinar, as well as all of our nutritional resources. Thank you and have an awesome day. And it looks sunny out. Everyone go get some vitamin D and go for a walk. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>